This session is Introduction to Core Data, um, and my name is Jake McMullen. So if uh, this is not the session you thought, feel free to go to the other session. Um, in particular, because I don't know how I, can, how I can compete with that previous session from Andre. It was great. So um, just at the very at the outset, I just want to lower your expectations. I'm not going to be anywhere nearly as entertaining as Andre. Um, hopefully, you'll still learn something. Uh, for those of you that use Twitter, I think the hashtag for the conference is DevWorld2010. So if you want to you know, tweet about how bad my presentation is, feel free to uh, use that hashtag. OK. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about core data. But before I talk about core data, I just uh, thought I'd introduce myself. So as I said, my name's Jake McMullen. Um, and I currently work for the ABC, uh, where I'm developing mobile applications, uh, including iView for the iPad. Um, which will be available, the official line is, later this year. Um, before working for the ABC, I worked for the BBC. Um, and at the BBC, I mainly focused on server-side development uh, using web objects, some of you may have heard of, uh, and working on the content management system that powers the BBC News and Sport websites, amongst others. And before that, one thing in common with Andre, I've worked at CSIRO, although I worked in uh, the Division of Land and Water uh, not the computer science part, but I worked um, with a, a team of people who were developing um, software to uh, model uh, the behavior of water in the landscape. So I did um, some web applications there and a little bit of desktop application development in .NET as well. Um, OK, but enough about me. Back to core data. Actually, before I start talking about core data, can I just get a little bit of a sense from the audience a bit about you? Uh, so how many of you are students? And staff, both students and staff simultaneously. A few, yep. OK, a good mix. Um, and how many of you have, uh, have done uh, application development on iOS before? So you've developed, yeah, OK, most people. Uh, have you got apps in the store? Yeah, I've got a couple there as well. They don't earn me any money, but anyway. Uh, OK, so I mean, a lot of you have probably then heard of Core Data. Yeah, most people. So I bet there's some here that have probably actually know more than I do about it. So I'm fairly new to core data on iOS. Um, although, I guess, so I guess like you, I might be learning some of this um, at the moment. Um, but hopefully I can, I don't know, share some of what I've picked up uh, recently. So what is core data? Well, it actually has quite a long history. And whilst I'm new to core data on iOS, I've used the various frameworks that have perhaps inspired core data in the past. So um, I think one of the core data has its beginnings in the enterprise objects framework, which uh, was part of web objects, um, part of the technology developed by Next, which has now made its way to Apple. Um, and enterprise objects framework was one of the very first object relational sort of persistence frameworks, a way of um, storing object oriented sort of data from object-oriented programs in relational database and getting it out again. Um, and it was first developed in 1995. And then um, in 2005, so a decade later, uh, Core Data came out for Coco on the desktop Mac. Uh, and that was sort of the first time that the desktop uh, Mac APIs had some sort of object persistence framework um, built into the, to the frameworks you get as developers. And uh, that brings us to almost to today. Uh, in 2009, with iOS 3.0, Core Data then became available on iOS as well. So I've, uh, as I said, I've used uh, EOF quite extensively in web objects. I've used Core Data on the desktop a fair bit, um, but I'm only just starting to use Core Data on iOS as well. So a little bit more about uh, my definition of Core Data, or the one I've gleaned from reading through all the documentation recently. So Core Data is a framework for managing object graphs. Um, so I'll just highlight a little bit about what I mean in that definition. Uh, most of you are obviously familiar with the idea of an object graph. Um, but if you're not, here's a diagram. This is an object, and that's an object graph. So you know, just a group of related objects, whether they're in memory or on disk or wherever. Um, but as you probably know in your experience developing applications, object graphs can very quickly become quite complex. Uh, you can have a lot of related objects taking up a lot of memory, and managing that graph of related objects can, can you know, start to become non-trivial. So this brings us to the second part of that definition, or the, 
first, which is uh, Core Data is a framework for helping to manage object graphs. So most of you probably know Core Data as a way of persisting data to disk and retrieving it again. Um, but it offers more than that. It offers other ways of helping you manage your object graphs. So I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Uh, property validation is one. Uh, change tracking or undo redo. Relationship maintenance. Um, object persistence, obviously, and we'll go into that in a bit more detail. Um, and also futures or faulting or lazy loading, however you want to refer to it. So before we get into looking at uh, object persistence, I thought I'd just highlight a few of these other ways that Core Data can help you manage your object graphs uh, and just describe what I mean in a little bit more detail. So change tracking, what do I mean there? Um, you can have an object graph, you might create a new object and add it to the graph, you might change one of the properties of an existing object. Um, Core Data is able to keep track of those changes that happen to the object graph uh, and then do things like undo it for you. Um, or alternatively, you might want to uh, ask Core Data to persist, persist those changes to disk. Next, uh, relationship management. So this is an, uh, quite a simple one. You add a new object to the object graph and Core Data can automatically uh, manage those relationships to create the relationship back from the child to its parent. Finally, uh, futures or faulting or lazy loading. What do I mean by that? Uh, so imagine a situation where you've got an object graph a bit like this one, one root object with a list of many related objects. Um, maybe it's hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of related objects. Uh, something that would be quite expensive to load. The way futures or faulting works is that um, when you first access an object in core data, uh, it doesn't automatically fetch all of the related objects. So uh, the object has a sense of the relationship. Uh, it will have an array property that you can actually um, talk to. You can ask that array for its count, things like that, um, and it will return accurate values. But it hasn't actually gone and gotten all of the data for all of those real objects from disk or from the persistent store uh, until you traverse that relationship and actually need it. So it's called variously futures or faulting or lazy loading. Uh, sometimes the, the kind of semi-object or proxy object that's in memory before it's actually been kind of fully hydrated is referred to as a fault. Um, yeah, so that, and that can be handy in terms of managing memory as well. Right, but moving on to the main thing that people know Core Data for, and that's persistence. So Core Data allows you to uh, persist your object graph to a persistent store. So you can use SQLite or a binary persistent store on iOS. On desktop Mac, there's also an XML persistent store, which is not available at the moment on iOS. OK, I should have mentioned at the outset, I'm really happy to take questions throughout the presentation as well. So if you've got something, if there's something I mentioned which you disagree with or you think you would like a little bit more information about, feel free to stick up your hand and interrupt me. Um, otherwise, there'll be time for questions at the end as well. So um, moving on to if that's what core data is, uh, a framework to help you manage your object graph, um, why might you use it? So here are some reasons. So if you have applications with complex object graphs uh, and you think your applications could benefit from some of the features that Core Data offers, such as change tracking. So you might, if you want to offer the ability to undo uh, a set of related changes. Uh, if you think you could benefit from having the, this lazy loading ability to load parts of your object graph into memory as and when you need them rather than loading it all at the outset. Those are all good reasons to look at using core data. Um, and of course, persistence, but you know. Why might you not use core data? And I don't, for any, um, at any time, saying that core data is for every application. Uh, certainly, if you've got um, an application that consists of quite simple object graphs, maybe with one root object and just a small number of related. Um, if you tend to change everything at once, so if the state of your objects as they are in memory, sort of tends to change atomically, like you basically replace everything with a new set of objects. Um, and if you use all of the objects all of the time, so you're not likely to want to start using you know, part of your object graph in one screen and only need the subsequent objects in a secondary screen. If you actually need them all at the outset, um, then perhaps there's less benefit from using core data. Uh, and if that's the case, but you're still looking at how to get persistence, how to persist your state between uses of your application, you might want to look at the NS coding protocol. So init with coder and decode with, with coder. Um, I've got a link to that at the end. 
that can be a really quick way of just persisting, serializing objects to disk and getting them back in again. Although it doesn't offer that sort of um, more complex object management that you get from core data. Right, so assuming I've convinced you that there might be a, uh, a, a time when you would consider using core data, how does it all work? Right, so um, the, the central kind of concept in core data is managed objects. So most people here familiar with the model view controller design pattern? Yeah, people have heard of it before. So in model view controller, uh, you've got a, a view. You know, you might build it in interface builder. It's the thing people interact with. You've got an intermediary controller layer that mediates the interaction from the view to an underlying uh, model layer. And that model layer is where you have sort of domain objects representing the, the things in the problem domain that your application is dealing with. So if you're writing an application that might be about managing the enrollment of students in courses, um, you know, the problem domain is to do with students and courses, and they, they would tend to be your domain objects. Uh, so that's where core data can really help you. It's with those domain objects. In core data, you refer to an object that's managed by core data as, as a managed object. And those objects exist in a context, in a managed object context. And it's the responsibility of that context to keep track of what happens to objects that it's managing. So when an object, um, you don't just sort of create an object in thin air, you create it in a context. Uh, and if you get an object that's previously been persisted, you fetch it into a context. So objects are always in, exist within this managed object context, and it's what provides the support for tracking changes, undo, redo, for saving things for you or restoring them, them later on. In turn, that managed object context has access to a persistent store coordinator, which has access to a persistent store. So the specific classes that are in play here are NS managed object or subclasses of NS managed object to represent your domain model, NS magic managed object context, NS persistent store coordinator. Um, and in a real world application, you may actually have uh, multiple contexts and multiple persistent stores. So in this sort of situation, you can see where the what the real role of the persistent store coordinator is, which is to be able to provide access to potentially more than one persistent store uh, and sort of bring it together in a coherent way. Any questions at this stage? OK. Uh, again, feel free to sing out if you have any. Uh, so I thought I'd get into a demo now and just show you some code uh, so you can see a little bit more about how to use core data um, and yeah, a bit more detail about what I'm talking about. So I've got this great idea for an application, um, which is basically like Twitter meets Flickr for coffee snobs. Um, you know, the idea that you're in a cafe and you have either a really great cup of coffee or a terrible cup of coffee and you decide you want to take a photo of it and tell all your friends and followers about how wonderful or terrible the experience was. Uh, so here's what the application is going to look like. Uh, and I thought this would be a good opportunity for core data. So um, in fact, I haven't built the social networking sides in yet. It's just a kind of a personal coffee uh, log at the moment where I can record for my own pleasure all the various cups of coffee I've drunk uh, and what I thought of them. Just so I can see uh, what you're looking at. Right, so I'm not going to write all of this code in front of you. I've got a kind of skeleton of an application here that I've already built, one I prepared earlier. Uh, so here it is running in the simulator. It's called Mugshots. Uh, tap the plus button to add a new review. Uh, I had coffee at a place called the Sensory Lab yesterday, and it was pretty good. Um, and I took a photo. Okay, I go back and there's, there's my cup of coffee. Uh, so I could add a bunch of reviews and have a, a list of all the places I've drunk coffee and what I thought of them. Uh, so that's the, the basis of the application. Um, the problem is if I quit the application, and because I'm running iOS 4 here, I actually have to properly quit the application. So if I properly quit the application and I load it again, um, all my data is gone. I, it wasn't persisted in between launches. So this is the classic you know, case of why you might want to use core data. Okay, so I'll just go through a little bit about um, 
the structure of this application so you can understand how it's all hanging together at the moment. Uh, so I've got my um, application delegate. And you know the main application delegate did finish launching method uh, where I just style the navigation bar a little bit. Uh, and then I add a sub view, um, the navigation controller's view, and I make that visible. And I've got a couple of controllers. So the root view controller, which is the first one that's presented, um, is a table view uh, delegate and data source. So it provides the list of uh, content for that table. Uh, when a cell is selected, can you all read that? All right, excellent. Sorry? There you go. So it doesn't hang off. Yeah. I didn't type it in this font size. I'll scroll back and forth for you. Uh, right, so then my table view did select row at index path method. Um, basically, you can see here I'm instantiating uh, the detail view controller. Uh, and I'm passing it the review that was selected, and then I'm pushing that onto the navigation controller stack to present the detail view. So it's basically a master view with a list of reviews. When you select one, I get an instance of the detail view and give it the one that you selected so it can be displayed. Uh, and then in the detailed uh, view controller method, um, I've basically got uh, actions that respond, or methods that respond to user interface actions. So a rate coffee method that's hooked up to all of those little coffee bean buttons, uh, and when you select one, it uh, sets the rating property of my rating object. Likewise, when you e finish editing the text field, it sets the venue name property of my um, rating, or sorry, my review object. Uh, and likewise, when you choose the photo, uh, I actually cr where am I doing that? Oh, that's choosing the photo. In the delegate method that's called after you've selected the photo, um, I create a mug shot. So I've got a basic object graph here of a review with a related object being the mug shot, the photograph of the of coffee, basically. Uh, so in this case, I create that and uh, associate it with the review. Um, so that's the basic structure of the application. What I want to do now is add some core data features to it to persist this. So uh, the first thing I need to do is to actually reference the core data framework. Uh, so I'm just going to expand frameworks and choose uh, add existing framework and choose core data, add a reference to it. Um, and now the next thing I need to do is to kind of create my core data stack. So I, as I mentioned earlier in the slides, Core data objects m exist within a managed object context that has reference to a persistent store coordinator, which has reference to a persistent store. So together, those things are commonly referred to as the core data stack. And the one that I'm mainly interested in is the managed object context. But in order to get that, I need everything else. Uh, so in my application delegate, what I'm going to do is um, just cr create some code. And clearly, I'm unprepared for this. No, I ha here's some code I wrote earlier. Um, so I'm just going to paste in the code to create this stack. So I need some instance variables. Oh, I also need one of these. All right, some instance variables to refer to the managed object model, the managed object context, the persistent store coordinator. Um, the managed object model is the sort of uh, model of our entities and how they relate, which I'm going to create in a little while. Uh, I'm going to create some properties for the same. And methods. Mm, I'll stick them in here. So what, what I've just copied and pasted in there are methods to override the um, getters. So I created read-only properties 
uh, in this class, one for the managed object model, one for the persistent store coordinator, and one for the managed object context. And I've uh, overridden the getters for those properties. So when you first ask for a managed object context, um, if it's not equal to nil, it returns the existing one. If it is nil, uh, it asks the persistent store coordinator to for a managed objects context using the property to access the persistent store coordinator. Likewise, it's got to, if non-nil, return the existing one. If nil, go and create it. So if you choose um, a new project from Xcode and ask to do a core data project, uh, it comes with this kind of core data stack baked in for you. I wanted to kind of build this up piece at a time just to sort of show you the magic that the Xcode templates are doing for you when you choose new core data. Um, but, and there's also a lot of sample code that it just includes this sort of boilerplate get a core data stack happening. As you can see, there are possibilities for errors in, in a real world application, you should probably handle them, I'm just ignoring them. Okay, so now that I've got my core data stack um, in the application delegate, the class I said I was most interested in is the managed object context. And that's where all my objects are gonna exist within that context. And the stuff that happens in each of the, the screens of my application is gonna need to access that context. So what I need to do is from, get my delegate, that um, my application delegate that's created this stack to provide, pass the context onto each of the other view controllers so that when my root, root view controller is there, it has access to it, and then when the detail view controller is there, it has access to it. Uh, so, right, I've done that already. Yeah, I think I'm actually gonna write this code because I didn't pre-write it properly, or did I? Uh, I knew I'd cheated. So what I need in each of my root view controller and my detail view controller is an instance variable for that managed object context. And I'd like a property as well. Obviously, I need to import the core data framework. And I'm guaranteed to have made a typo here. Wow, it all builds. I'm sure I've, I've left something out, but anyway, I'm sure we'll find out when I try and run it. Uh, so I've now written the code so that there's an instance variable and a property for this managed object context in both the root controller and the detail controller. Uh, I now need to pass it around. So in uh, my application delegate, in the application did finish launching method, What I want to do here is obtain a reference to the root view controller. So this is created in my uh, user interface sort of nib file. Um, but because I want to set an explicit property on it, I'm asking the navigation controller for its top view controller and casting it to a root view controller. So I've now got a reference of it. Uh, and I'm setting it in its managed object context to be equal to the application delegates managed object context. So when the app launches, uh, I create this managed object context pass it to the root view controller uh, before the root view controller is displayed. And then in the root view controller, when I am um, about to create a detailed view controller because uh, a review was selected, uh, I need to pass it on as well. So in here, oops. So set managed object context to be 
the same one. OK. Uh, so I think that's most of the kind of scaffolding code I've, I need to get a core data stack running in this application. Uh, the next step, obviously, is to replace um, the domain object sort of layer of the application. So my review and my uh, mugshot model objects. Uh, these are just sort of plain old uh, Objective-C objects. They uh, don't have to know anything about core data. Uh, so what I need to do is to replace them. I'm actually just going to trash these ones uh, and create some new ones that represent uh, managed objects. Uh, basically the same, they have the same sort of API. So to do this, I'm going to create a, um, a managed object model. So I've chosen a new file from the Xcode menu. And it's a resource, a iPhone OS resource, and I'm going to create a data model. And I'm going to call it Ugg Shots. Right, so now what you can see, this is the sort of Xcode data modeler. Um, again, it has its kind of heritage in the EOF world. There's a thing called entity modeler or EO modeler, um, which is basically an entity modeler. So what you're doing is creating this abstract concept of an entity being um, the things in your application. So in mine, I'm going to have a review entity and a mugshot entity. And then those entities are kind of mapped onto more concrete things, onto objects. So I'm going to create a class to represent each of those. Um, and onto a more concrete way of persisting them in the database. So in EOF, it was all, always object relational mapping. So generally, your entity was mapped to an object, a class, and to a relational database table. And so the role of the model um, file was to, to do that mapping. There are different ways of persisting uh, core data objects to different types of persistent store, not just a relational database table. Uh, so if it's the binary store, but you still need to set up that basic thing about what um, are the attributes of these entities and what, are, what sort of data types they have. So I'm going to add two entities. Just click the plus button to add two. And the first one I'm going to call review. And the second one, mugshot. And you can see here I can choose the class. So review, I'm going to call it the class review. Mugshot, I'm going to call the class mugshot. And you can see this nice diagram view as well. So review, I need a couple of attributes. Uh, venue name. And that's a string. So you can put in some stuff like a default value if you want. Another attribute, which is the rating. And make that an integer. Uh, and then finally, a relationship, which is the mugshot. Sorry, I need to refer to my code. So I make sure that I, yeah, capital S, camel case, excellent. Uh, so in the relationship, uh, I've got the name of the relationship and the destination entity. So it's going to point to mugshot and whether or not there's an inverse relationship and whether it's a one-to-one -one relationship or a one-to-many. Um, there is no inverse relationship yet, but I'm going to go in and create it because uh, Core Data really likes to have inverse relationships. In fact, it generates a warning if you haven't put one in. So from mugshot, the relationship is going to be called review, and obviously it's to review, and now there is an inverse, which is to mugshot. So you can now see I've got this relationship set up between my review entity and my mugshot entity. Uh, of course, mugshots needs one other thing, which is the attribute, uh, which is the image data. And that's of type binary data. Now, it probably is not a good idea to... Um, use core data to persist the actual binary data of my photos in this app. I um, haven't really thought about it too deeply, um, but you know, fetching binary data out of an SQL-like persistent store or even the core data binary persistent store might not be as efficient as reading it from you know, some file where I've just written the images. But I just wanted to use this as an example of um, 
also the reason I've sort of factored Mugshot out as a separate entity from review. Um, partly it's contrived just for the example, so I've got more than one entity. But partly it's actually to make use of a feature of Core Data, which is that lazy loading or faulting. So in the application, if you remember, the first screen just lists the reviews with the venue names and doesn't show photographs. So if I've got a thousand reviews in my you know, log of where I've drunk coffee over the years, um, I don't want to fetch all of the images for all of those reviews straight away. And by default, uh, if you load an entity from a persistent store in Core Data, it will load the data for all of the attributes of that entity. You can't just say, I want the name but not the photo field. However, if you factor something out into a separate related entity, like I have done here, uh, that lazy loading or faulting or futures technology will mean that um, the, only the review entities will be pulled out and the mugshot entities won't be until you actually need them. Uh, so we might see that in a bit more detail. OK, I think I've set this model up right. Um, so what I'm actually going to do now is generate source code from my model uh, for, for these classes. So I've got the model highlighted uh, on the left-hand side in Xcode. And if I go to File, New File, whilst having that highlighted, and choose Coco Touch Class, you can see I get this option of a Managed Object Class. And if I choose Next, uh, it will ask me where I want to store those classes. And I want to put them in the Classes subdirectory. And now it's asking me which entities I'd like to generate classes for. So I want to generate classes for both my entities. And down here, it's got options to whether or not I want to generate accessor methods and Objective-C2 style properties, which I do. So I'll click Finish. And it's generated them for me. It may well be storing them in that classes subdirectory, but it hasn't put them there. Uh, so I'll move them. So basically, uh, I shouldn't now have to touch that code. I'll collapse it and make it go away. Yeah, it's not building. Why? Really? I wrote that there? Sorry about this live debugging. I should um I think I did find this bug in my pull through. I think it's because I haven't done that. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so basically what I've done is I referenced the core data framework. I added the boilerplate code to my application delegate to create the core data stack. I passed that manage object context onto each of the view controllers that would need it. I replaced my uh, domain objects with modeled domain objects from managed, uh, managed objects. Uh, and now the only thing left to do is to uh, hook up some actions to do some saving and loading. So if we, before I do that, let's just run and make sure this is still functioning. Uh, it should still behave as it did, uh, although it's not. Set venue name. Really? Doesn't anyone see what I've done wrong? It reckons my uh, review class doesn't have a set venue name method. But really, it does. OK, sorry, I'll have to bail out and uh, use one I prepared earlier. 
uh, which I know works, but in fact, sorry, this one's got, I've done even more of the code in. Right, so I'll take you through the next part of the code that I've already written in this one that I was going to add step by step, which is basically the code ne necessary to save, to tell the managed object context to save the changes that it's observed to disk and read them in again. So basically, in each of the various ways the application might end, so in resign, active, enter, background, and terminate, uh, I've got the same code, which is uh, if the managed object context is non-nil, and it has changes, then ask it to save those changes. Uh, you pass that method an error, which you should do something about, but I'm not. Um, and then likewise, in the application did finish launching. Ooh. I don't know if I've actually got the code in here to load it. Oh, I think I put that in. Um, in the root view controller. Yeah, so in the method that's populating the, um, that root view controller's list, previously it was just uh, allocating a new array, um, which is why it was always empty when it launched. Uh, and now it's got the code to actually request those list of reviews from the managed object context. So I'm creating a fetch request, uh, an entity description saying I want the entity called review associating that entity description with the request, saying this is the entity I want you to get, um, and then asking the managed object context to execute that request, and then assigning them to an, a property, an array of this class. So this one should work. Uh, the other thing you can see I've got up here is save and cancel buttons. Um, I'll show you the code behind them in a second. So I've hit save. Um, Sensory Labs there. I will quit it so that it's actually quit. And launch it. And it's still there. Ah, fantastic. So it's saving and restoring. Uh, so the other thing I just wanted to show you, you quickly was um, I mentioned before that you can easily add support for undo to, um, to applications. So, you know, if you perhaps I've ch I go and change this photo to a different one and decide, oh, that's not right, I want to bail out, click cancel, and it should have bailed out, which it did. Uh, so that's, that's really trivial once you're using core data. Um, what I, so what I've actually done to set that up is in my uh, detail view controller's view did load method, I've um, re registered for a notification. So core data uh, will send some notifications, and the one that I've registered to, to receive is managed object context objects did change notification. Uh, so this will be sent whenever any of the objects managed by a managed object context have changed. Uh, so when you first load the objects, uh, the managed object context knows their state. If you set any of the properties on any of the objects, uh, it'll fire this notification. An object has changed. Uh, so what I'm doing, uh, I've got a method values changed in response to that. Uh, and what it does is go, OK, well, something's changed. So uh, modify the buttons in the navigation item to provide a save button and an undo button or a cancel button uh, to allow the user to choose what they want to have done with those changes. Uh, and then those buttons are hooked up to uh, methods save and cancel. So the save method just does that code that I showed you earlier. It asks if the managed object context has changes, which it should do, uh, it asks it to save. Uh, and then it sets those buttons back to, to nil and pops the detail view controller off the stack to go back to the previous view. And cancel just calls this method rollback, managed object context rollback. And what that does is, uh, will take the managed object context back to its original state um, under any changes that uh, haven't been committed. There's also a separate method called undo, uh, which will ask the managed object context to just undo a series of changes. Um, but in order to use that, you've actually got to set up um, an undo manager, which by default in core data on iOS is set to nil. 
Um, so undo actually does nothing. On Coco, by default, there is one set up, so undo would be the method to call. Um, yeah, so the difference in this case is that I need to either... Basically, you can, this undo will only work if the only changes that have happened to the, the managed object context are the ones that I want to undo. So, um, yeah, it works in this case. Yeah, and then it does the same thing. Uh, so the other thing I, I said that I might show you is the um, faulting or lazy loading. In my mugshot um, implementation, I'm just going to override a method which is called if awake from fetch. So um, all managed objects are subclasses of NS managed object. It defines this class, uh, this method awake from fetch, and it's executed when uh, a managed object has has been fetched. Um, and what I'll do here is uh, just log something. I'm awake, which hopefully you're all still awake too. Okay, and run. So if I look at my um, console, hopefully I haven't seen I'm awake. No. Uh, access that, and you get the I'm awake. So that's the mugshot class. Uh, basically, you know, it wasn't faulting, it wasn't loading into memory until we'd accessed it. And I didn't have to do anything special for that. You know, basically set the relationship up and Core Data manages that for me. So has anyone got any questions about the code or this application before I move back to slides? Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. So it's uh, by default you get a persistent store set up for you in the boilerplate code when you say new um, core data project. I glossed over that. That was in the persistent store coordinator um, method. Right, so here, I, this code is setting up that persistent store. So I've just uh, created a URL of where I want to store it, and I'm storing it in a file called mugshots.sqlite. And then uh, when I'm initializing the persistent store coordinator, um, you, you add a persistent store with type and tell it the type you want to use um, and the URL. So. Yeah, this one's defaulting to SQLite. If I wanted to change that to binary, um, I could actually use the same path if I really wanted to and just change this to NS binary store type. And that, that would now use a binary data store instead of an SQL. It would, it would confuse the hell out of me because it still has got that extension, but it would be binary. Yep. Yeah, so... Um, Oh, yeah, so multi-threading and core data is a topic, an entirely separate topic, and it is possible to have a multi-threaded core data. Um, so the various ways of achieving that are you can have multiple managed object contexts, and there's an extent to which if you keep the context separate, it's safe to do so. Generally, that's not for concurrency, though. That's more for um, partitioning changes. So, for example, if you've got a multi-step um, series of screens where you can set up some details... You might actually want to create a new managed object context to do all of those steps in, so that if you undo one part, it undoes kind of a logical unit. Um, the other way is to have, as we saw before, multiple persistent stores managed by one persistent store coordinator. But again, that's probably not for concurrency. It's more for if you want to partition, logically partition the data into different types of store. Um, generally, if you want to have concurrency, you, have, you replicate the whole core data stack. So you have two stacks at one and keep each stack in its own thread and make sure the, the thread that it's created in is the only thread that accesses it and vice versa. Um, there's some good stuff about that in the WWDC session on core data, which are the videos are all available online and I've got a link in my slides. So if we put these slides up, there'll be a link there. Uh, any other questions at this stage? I've only got a few more slides, so I'll just jump back to slides and whiz through them and then... Um, yeah, we can... See if you've got any more questions. I can't remember what. Oh yeah, I've got like two more slides. Uh, so basically, next steps. If I've convinced you that core data, it, you know, might add something to your application and you have not yet tried it, uh, I suggest reading the, the core data programming guide. And this is a link. So uh, if you Google for that, you'll find it. But otherwise, if you follow this link, 
um, and also work through the core data tutorial. So a lot of the code in this is you know, almost straight out of that. Um, and again, watch that session from, from WWDC. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, for NS coding, um, there's an archives and serializations guide. So if you just want to basic uh, persistence without any of the other object graph management features, then, then perhaps that's an option. Uh, finally, questions. So any other questions?